Well, it's good to have you here, and welcome to those who are watching us live stream. And we're going to sing just exactly what Nancy was playing as we come to our creation seminar with field paleontologist Tommy Loman. 16, 16, how great thou art, how great thou art, hymn number 16. my chairman of the board to open in a word of prayer from where he's at. Five hundred and sixty three will be the last song. Five sixty three. All that thrills my soul. Five six three.
Tommy, if you'd come and share with us what the Lord laid on your heart. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. How's everyone this fine afternoon? Good. All right. I was sitting here as we were singing and just thinking about the importance of understanding how God has not just constructed our world, but how he's also judged our world. And so when we look into the Bible and begin to understand what the flood of Noah's day, we call the Genesis flood, the implications of that are quite profound. I find that as we engage with different people, whether I have conversations up on the dig site, whether we see people at the museum in settings such as this, or even social media, which is an interesting platform to be having any kind of discussion at all. But we find that people have a range of ideas and perspectives. I would guess that most of us have been raised in an environment in which we were taught the earth is millions and millions of years old, slow gradual processes. What I hope to accomplish this afternoon, and in particular with this first session, is to begin to frame some new insights regarding geology, to take some old ideas and begin to shift their perspectives, to begin to apply a biblical worldview to those concepts. And I'm being vague at the moment, but we'll certainly flesh that out a little bit more as we go. I know inevitably you'll have questions and hoping at the end of our time we'll be able to have some Q&A and be able to address some of those things. But let's walk through some of what I've got prepared for you this afternoon. As a field paleontologist, I'm asking questions about dinosaurs. But I was particularly intrigued with Dr. John Whitmore's quote here. He says, one of the neat things we do as creation scientists we kind of have a different way of looking at things. And so we tend to collect data and look for data that probably other people miss, or they probably have seen it, but don't think deeply about it and think about the implications. That is one of the things I enjoy most about being a creation scientist is there are so many discoveries out there just waiting for us. And so much of what I hope to present to you is personal insights, but is also research that others have put in, and I want to hopefully frame that for us. Because we're really beginning to see creation science in particular really begin to blossom, where we're beginning to see men with PhDs and women with PhDs press into their fields of study and ask new questions in light of a biblical worldview. For me, when I think about dinosaurs and what God has uh, enabled me to look at and consider, I look at dinosaurs and try to understand their created kind. In fact, if I could draw your attention in particular to the back of the room, you don't have to look, but there's a, a panel back there where I discuss created kinds. Uh, those figurines back there are not just for your entertainment, but I want you to kind of begin to get a sense as you look at those figurines is to begin to recognize how they're grouped together. And this is what intrigues me is how God has crafted life with a particular kind, but we see these groups and those groups can express themselves with genetic variation. I enjoy the study of biomechanics and physiology, and we talked about some of that last year how we can look at a bone and really begin to understand how does it function. And then the relationship in general between science and theology, and really that's kind of the next step I want to take for us this afternoon, is to begin to recognize the importance of the relationship between science and theology, but how that should work. Because uh, so often in our education in particular, we've been pressed to see those as two different paradigms of which they don't have any relationship. And I would say that's not true. We need to understand the nature of that relationship. So for my methodology of how I've really approached this whole subject in particular of the flood uh, of Noah's day, I wanna unpack some of that thinking. First of all, on science. A scientist in practicing science and acquiring knowledge 
is he is observing the world that's in front of him. He begins to test those observations, running, what does he see? What data is he collecting? What hypotheses are he formulating? Are they true? Are they not? How can he press forward with them or dismiss them? Then as those observations uh, become uh, stronger, then he begins to draw conclusions upon the tests that he's making. And then he begins to build what I call a scientific model. Now, just so I can stop for just a moment, as a scientist, any scientist in any discipline, you're only looking at what's happening now. Uh, the fossils that we have here, the rocks, petrified material here, these are all found in the moment, in the present. And when we pulled them out of the ground in a given moment, we recognize that we can make some initial observations about the particulars, but there's a whole history behind any given fossil that we have to make assumptions about. And that's filtered by our worldview. So with dinosaurs, no fossil has any information regarding its age, how long it was in the ground. And so we have to process our worldview. If you believe the earth is millions of years old and evolution has been the process, you're going to interpret these fossils in that light. If you believe God created life supernaturally, complex and complete from the very beginning some 6,000 plus years ago, and that the Bible is the literal history of the world, then you're going to interpret these fossils in that light. And so that distinction is important. And so I think not only is this is how science functions, but when it goes to building its scientific models, it is important that it does more than just that. Because while I'm not going to get into the, if you will, the weeds of that this afternoon, it is important that as scientists, I believe they should inherently perceive their limitations. Science is a thing we should practice, but science is always a thing that has limitations to it. Inherently, uh, scientists should perceive design in complexity. That's part of how we look at life. And we see life is not some randomly uh, formulated process that just popped out of the goo of life or the goo of the, of the world and grew in its complexity. We see an inherent level of complexity. When we see complexity, we recognize information. When we have information, we recognize a mind. When we have a mind, we recognize personhood. I think scientists should inherently perceive transcendence and divinity. Now what I'm beginning to press you on and I want you to be aware of is that when you hear a scientist making a position and you recognize he is not inherently recognizing his limitations, he's not inherently recognizing design in the system, he's not inherently recognizing divinity, God, then you begin to recognize or should begin to recognize he is not interpreting his information in the same worldview that you are. And you should at least pay close attention to what he's doing. On the other hand, when we begin to look at theology and understand what the Bible is saying about God, how it unfolds itself is a valid historic document. It sets a historic framework for us. It informs us about origins events, one-time beginning events, special unique events such as the flood. The Bible declares God is the designer, the engineer, who is separate, transcendent from creation. And so it should serve as an authority over the realm of science. Now that right there is where you're going to lose the rest of the audience, so to speak, in a scientific world. Because most scientists are not going to walk in here and say, you're right, the Bible, the Bible should be my authority and it should restrict me. But when you have the creator of the universe revealing himself and who he is and how he's worked in this world, that should be a governing process for every scientist. So I find when we think about how this has played out in history, Robert Jastrow uh, from the God and the Astronomer's book says, for the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. 
He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He is about to conquer the highest peak. As he pulls himself over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. And I would add this right here, because this is so much of what we engage with the world due to our fallen nature and an education system of naturalism, which is a rejection ultimately of God. This teaching, generally, we lack a true depth of faith in God as creator in his word to clearly reveal this truth. The net result is a failure to view God in the Bible as the supreme authority in all areas of life, including those of scientific inquiry. We all too often give science authority over the Bible. This misplaced authority is damaging. It creates the false belief that somehow the Bible has failed and that science has succeeded where the Bible failed. A byproduct of this contradiction is an education system filled, filled with scientists who believe they are the sole purveyors of knowledge in their given discipline. This can produce a distorted view of self, a failure to rightly understand the limits of their work and vulnerabilities in the uninformed and the vulnerable. And so these are important distinctions that we need to at least understand as we move forward. You young people, as you're engaging with the world, you need to understand that that is at least at play, and then we can determine how we engage with that in the process. Because what the Bible does, and it sets itself as a history uh, of the world from a biblical worldview, the earth and the universe are finite. They have a beginning and an end. Genesis 1.1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And in 2 Peter 3.10 says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. And so the Bible declares this bookend of this creation but God transcends that creation. In fact, the Bible reminds us of this very fact. In Revelation 1.8 says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Amen. This is just not saying that God is present in the beginning and He's present in the end. That's not saying He's old and He's figured out a way to circumvent the system. It's saying that He's transcendent. He's something totally different from creation. And everything in creation is totally in subjection to God and God alone. We're going to get to geology in just a minute, okay? Just a few more points here. Creation exists on a linear plane of time. Time is not a cycle, as we might see and hear from some. God is sovereign over that time, which is an important thing to be thinking about within creation. Time is not a thing that coexists with God. Time in and of itself is part of this creation. Creation is planned by God and that He spoke creation into existence. He cursed His creation at the fall. He judged his creation in the Genesis flood, and he made a new creation, which we will see, and I believe is prepared for us at this very moment, and that we long for that creation. What I want to do with this weekend, starting this afternoon, into the morning, really into the evening, is begin to look at geology and the flood of the earth from a large picture, and we're going to work our way down and down and down until tomorrow evening, we're gonna, I'm going to introduce you to Ruth. Who in here has met Ruth before? We got any Ruth fans in here? We got a few Ruth fans in here. <laughs> Ruth is an Edmontosaurus dinosaur skeleton that we got to dig up this past summer. And so we'll be concluding things tomorrow evening where I'll begin to really just take you to the dig site, show you some pictures, talk about what's going on. Uh, because I know for most of us, although this church is an exception to that rule, most people have never been to a dig site. What does it mean to see a dinosaur skeleton? So, we're going to outline for the set, first session here, we're going to look at the Bible. We're going to look at flood deposits. We're going to look at the uplift of mountains. We're going to look how in that uplift they were bent and tilted. And then we're going to look at the flood water runoff. 
and we're going to try to answer some key questions about fossils and mountains in the process. So let's start with the Bible here. The geology of creation and the flood. We see here in Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there were the evening and the morning were the first day. Now there's much more to extract from these first five verses than I'm going to do right now. But what I want you to see right here is we begin to think about the creation of the world. What I see here is a description of the initial phases of the world, of the earth, as much as we see it today, meaning it would have had a core, inner and outer, and it would have had mantle. But it would have been covered by water alone, and there would have been no visible land. Now, some of you all are asking the question in your mind, so I'm going to go ahead and answer it now without you asking it out loud, okay? The earth was rotating, and that God, in separating the light from the darkness, means he's giving movement to light. And all you need for a day to exist is for light to come from a direction and a full rotation of the earth, and you have what? One day. That's all that you need. And that is happening here. When we move into Genesis 1, 9, and 10, we may be looking at what we call a single supercontinent. I'll talk about that with respect to Pangaea in just a moment. But God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together in one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. So this is where, where you begin to get the sense that the land was one and everything else was water, is this very nature of the text. When we see in Psalm 104, we see these first couple of verses about reminding us of God laying the foundations of the earth. We see in Job 38, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Not only is God the creator, but what is he referring to? Are we talking about the inner core? Or are we beginning to talk about the dry land? But I find it intriguing here in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 5, it says, By the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water. Now this is in response to some scoffers that Peter had been dealing with. And I think what Peter is describing is the waters coming out, the dry land coming from the mantle below and filling the dry land. When I think about this from a dogmatic standpoint, can we say that it's a single continent? We cannot. But what does this give us? Well, first of all, if you've got multiple continents and it comes time for the flood and God's going to bring all the animals to the ark, it doesn't mean that God can't get the animals to the ark from other land masses, but this certainly helps make that an easier process. And most geologists secular or Christian, either one recognize the idea of Pangaea, the breaking part of the land masses. So this one land mass gives us this, this starting point for something to be broken up later. And so what I visualize here, because the rocks that we have today, some of these are right down here, all essentially come from the mantle itself. The mantle is the hot plasticky type material that is under the crust. We are on continental crust right now. There is oceanic crust. The oceanic crust on average is about seven to 10 miles thick. Continental crust is between 20 and 30 miles thick. All of that is sitting on the mantle, but all of that finds its origin and source in the mantle itself. And so what I'm thinking here is that what God supernaturally does is he's not just throwing dry land to form in the waters, but he's actually bringing it up 
out of the mantle through the waters to form the dry land. And this formation process is what we would call Pangea, which means just one earth. A gentleman named Antonio Snyder Pellegrini in the mid-1800s first proposed this idea, and it was really just that biblical foundation from Genesis chapter 1 when he proposed it. Now, he didn't get much attention at this point. First of all, I think a lot of it is some of the attention went to Charles Darwin because Darwin's Origin of Species was also released in 1859. We press forward into 1912, and Alfred Wegener proposed a similar idea but he failed to have a mechanism, and so his idea was also dismissed. And that's really an important thing for me, is what mechanism do we have that presses land masses apart? And I think this is what's so beautiful about the flood. We pressed forward here about 20 years ago when Dr. John Baumgartner finally proposed catastrophic plate tectonics. And part of his doctoral thesis was to create some computer modeling as to one landmass, and if we look at the fracture points in the Earth today, what kind of directions would that have created? And so I think it's really an elegant model. It really is in line with the biblical narrative, and it also reflects to a high detail what we see in the Earth itself. And when we think about the flood, it is one of the more highly detailed biblical narratives that we have in all of Scripture. We see the key points of three chapters. We see eight people surviving the flood. We see references to the type of life that was on the ark. We see measurements. We see dates. And it's clearly tied, the, the, the reason for the flood is clearly tied to the wickedness of man and his sin and the judgment of God upon that sin. That is a clear correlation. And then the New Testament makes multiple references back to the flood as a key point. And so the flood narrative becomes a huge place for us to kind of settle in and think about what's going on. Genesis 7, 11 says, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day, of the month. On that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain fell upon the earth forty days and forty nights. And so, what we see here is this geological event that is both tectonic and water driven. And I'll, I'll kind of walk into that just a little bit more. Now, when we press forward into this particular chapter, Genesis 7. 17 says, and the flood was 40 days upon the earth, and the waters increased. Verse 18 says, the waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth. Verse 19 says, the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills were covered. Verse 20 says, 15 cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. Anybody got any idea what's trying to be communicated here? Any guesses? Do we see that the text is clearly communicating that water in the system is being aggressively moved to inundate the landmass, the landmass that God brought out of the waters in Genesis chapter 1 in the creation week are now being inundated by the waters. Now, just a quick, couple of quick points on that. I don't think any new water came into the system. I'm not really a canopy theory person. I don't believe there were treasures of water up in the heavens. Certainly, I think there was rain. I think what we're seeing here simply in this narrative and what we see geologically is a reorienting orienting of the water that's already present, both water and mantle. And those two are being shifted in the system to create the land masses to drop so that they will be inundated by water. That's really the biggest thing that I see that's going on right here. When we look at this chart right here, I find it intriguing. It's really interesting how it's done. It gives you a sense of the biblical narrative of what I was just sharing with you. We haven't pressed into chapter 8 yet but you begin to see the initial phase of 40 days and nights of rain 
this is really an aggressive phase of the flood, but we see it continuing to press itself deeper. Now, this is going to be important here as I begin to make some of my next geological points. But what we're beginning to recognize is we, from a biblical standpoint, see this narrative and we simply see God describing water inundating the earth. But what we can't see is what's going on under the waters. What's going on to the earth itself? What systems are being altered? How is the sediment being deposited? What shifts and movements are going on? How are the continents being separated? All of that's not really being addressed here, but we can logically deduce this is happening here. From days 41 to day 151, this is continuing to press into the system. And so you've got basically five months of aggressive movement of the water and tectonic activities literally reshaping the face of the planet, literally. And it's at day 151 that, that the, the chapter 8 tells us that God ceases this activity. Now, this doesn't mean that what's going on under the waters in the earth itself is all of a sudden just shut off. There's still movement. Everything's still wet. Everything's still pliable. The sediment that would have been in the water is going to continue to settle out. And I'm going to show you some things here. So let's look here just by way of just giving you a visual. But the fountains of the great deep, they're going to begin to break through from the mantle into the crust, into the ocean floor, and separate and really modify. This next slide is a short little video clip. I found it from Answers in Genesis several years ago. And basically, it's the it gives you a, a really short glimpse as to what the flood might have looked at in those early stages. A couple of things I want you to look for is you'll see a fountain shooting up from the ocean floor. That's part of the fountains of the great deep bursting forth. And you'll see the progression of the inundation. So let's take a look at this. Sells what's going on. But hopefully it gives you a little bit of a flavor. This is a, a map that's been crafted of the ocean floor. And uh, that red line of God's called the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. It's been mapped. It's clearly there. What I see is that is a fracture point of which the fountains of the Great Deep, one of them, would have burst through. Of course, the continents would have all been connected at that point, so it's breaking through the continents. If you remember, I mentioned Alfred Wegener had his theory of uh, continental movement rejected because it lacked a mechanism. I still see what, what modern geology produces is they just have 
continental movement, but what is driving it today sufficiently? And this is what I see with the flood, is it provides a power and a strength to move continents when nothing else can. And so I've got these arrows basically just showing how the separation likely would have looked. Now when we think about the flood, we recognize that the fountains of the deep were a key. We recognize the pressing apart of the uh, land masses. You can actually correlate fossils uh, from one continent and the other, same type. You see the connection there. What uh, Dr. Snelling adds is really intriguing here. He says the earth movements and the earthquakes they would have generated would have produced many cataclysmic tsunamis that swept over the continents, contributing to relatively minor water level fluctuations within the large scale surges that deposited the mega sequences, which is what we're going to build to. I want to introduce, has anybody heard of the term mega sequence before? Besides Tim. <laughs> Good job, Tim. So point two, the deposit, the flood laid down large sequences of sediment. I want to just set this point for us to be sure, because sometimes we look at rocks and we think rocks have always been rocks, hard <coughs> rocks, right? But no rock has always existed in its current form. Sedimentary rocks are minerals that have been put together. And so when you think about what's going on, the flood is taking individual minerals and it is binding them together with moisture and then they're drying out and solidifying. And much as you would have concrete for a fence post, the water is there and once the water evaporates, it solidifies into a rock, if you will. This kind of feature is really all across the planet, as we see from the red wall limestone, we can get into the chalk of England, we see these layers of this type of material. Now, when we begin to think about the sequence or the mega sequence, was, there's an idea first introduced by Lawrence Sloss. And so he was one who had begun to map the layers across the earth and you recognize six transgressions. Now, for, for my invocation of you to let you know, I've seen a range of four to six. So if you see some of my literature mentioning five or six, there is some debate over that. But I want you to know there are multiple transgressions and regressions. A transgression is where the water came across onto the land, and then the water came back off the land. And they can map that and see that in the ground itself. And so he's the first to recognize that and coin the term mega sequence. Now, at the risk of influencing your breakfast choice tomorrow, the, one of the ways that I want you to begin to think about the earth and the ground that we see is this idea of pancakes. And one pancake is one sequence. And so if you had six sequences, you would have six pancakes. And what makes it a mega sequence is if those pancakes literally spread out across North America. And that's literally what we see in geology. Here is a Dr. Um, Steve Austin and Dale Tackett down at the bottom of Grand Canyon. Now what they're standing on is what they believe is the bedrock, the granite that it would have been really potentially where the flood would have eroded everything away up above, and this would have been the last layer the flood would not have eroded away. So it strips it away, and then when new sediment gets to dep be deposited, you'll see the sand sandstone sequence that's first being laid down here. And I've got another video I want to show you here that will give you a little bit of a glimpse more of what this mega sequence is and the value of understanding the flood. Now, before, before I do that, one of the things that I've always pondered with the flood is more of an idea of rain for 40 days and 40 nights. What I'm beginning to see is the flood was an event which brought a layer of sediment in and dropped it and left it. The waters would wash back out to some degree and bring in another layer of sediment. And so you're beginning to see what the flood would have done is stack sediment on top 
in a progressive manner. It's not just simply rain, waters come up. There's much more going on. And Dr. Snelling will make a difference here, I think, in how you see that. All right, so you wanted to come here because you see evidence uh, of a young earth uh, because of, of what's here. What, what do you see? Yes, well, the first thing we notice is the extent of these layers. It's like a stack of pancakes. For example, the red unit that goes all the way across mm -hmm. our field of view, that's the Schneebly Hill Formation. And above that, you can see the first white unit is the Coconino Sandstone. And above that, you've got the Tura Weep, and at the horizon, you've got the Kaibab Limestone, which is the, the rim rock of the Grand Canyon. And you know, here we are, 70 more miles from the Grand Canyon, and these layers are still here. Yeah. It's almost hard to imagine the volume of material that that represents. Yes, take the Coconino Sandstone. We can trace it from here, right across New Mexico, Colorado, right over towards Kansas and Oklahoma, or even in Texas. We're talking at least 200,000 square miles mm. for this one rock unit that's consistent for mile after mile after mile. That's not the scale that we see today with localised sedimentation. And to get it flat lying like this over such a large area, it's like you have to make your pancake all at once very rapidly. Mm -hmm. And so these layers show evidence of rapid sedimentation, the, the extent of these layers. Well, Andrew, you, you were talking about that red formation, but that doesn't sound familiar to me. No, that's the Snebley Hill Formation. It's not in the Grand Canyon. In the Grand Canyon, we go from the Coconino into the Hermit Formation. There's that knife edge boundary, and there's no evidence of erosion there, which means that the Hermit Formation was rapidly deposited, and then immediately the coconino was a deposit on top of it. But here, we've come 70 miles from the Grand Canyon and we've got this Snebley Hill formation between the coconino and the hermit. Right. And this Snebley Hill formation, 800 to 1,000 feet thick over an area of 1,000 square miles, had to have been formed very rapidly. If, if, it, if that took millions of years, we ought to see millions of years of yes. evidence of millions of years erosion back in the Grand Canyon mm -hmm. at that same boundary. We don't. So that means that this Nebula Hill formation in this area had to form in a matter of hours. So it tells you that not only is there a lack of erosion, but there's no time between those boundaries. So the whole sequence of layers was very rapidly deposited. that I find intriguing, and it's what we're seeing creation scientists such as Dr. Snelling begin to observe and test and put forth. That for years we've been left with particular insights, given a story and a narrative, and left to either dismiss it or ignore it or, or just throw our hands up. And so I appreciate what Dr. Snelling and others are doing in light of this. He talks here in 1963 about a landmark paper uh, that talked about the sequence, the layers. Uh, during the early 80s, the American Association of Petroleum Geologists conducted a massive project to line up and match the rock layers at all the local sequences across North America. Determined from the drill holes and the rock layers that are exposed on the surface, the outcome was an overwhelming confirmation that these str strange mega sequences do exist. For geologists who believe in local floods, it was strange to find large-scale deposits thousands of feet thick covering entire continents. What explains this? What well, one large global event? The Salk mega sequence, which is one of the base layers that we're talking right here, you see the map there. Uh, the there's some varying sediments that are within this one sequence, the salt mega sequence. So you get a scope here just generally looking at North America at how far they've been able to trace it. This is what Dr. Snelling was alluding to in the video. Then you begin to recognize that he's also been able to find this type sequence in North Africa as well. The same sequence. 
which suggests what? They suggest that this was all laid down at one time over multiple continents. Now, being up here in Wisconsin, I thought, well, I saw on the map of North America that this Salk mega sequence came up here into Wisconsin. So I found this map here. And that tan is part of that Salk mega sequence. Now, why do we not have it in this part of the state? You need to think about on the edges where we're going to have is erosion of the floodwaters coming off the edges. And so these sequences are going to find themselves probably laid down completely to the edges, but as the floodwaters, which would have still been in place, as they start to run off, they're going to erode the edges more quickly. And so what you're seeing here, because you guys have what to the east of us? <laughs> A lake. And so the water has eroded that direction and has eroded the edges. Probably this salt mega sequence sandstone went all the way to the edge at one point in the past, but has eroded out. And so when we begin to look at things like the, the Grand Canyon, we see these layers tucked in here, as Dr. Snelling was alluding to. And as big as the Grand Canyon is, it's really a small picture of even a larger process. This is the uh, Grand Staircase. This stretches from the Grand Canyon all the way up into Utah. And what you'll see on the right there is you see the Grand Canyon and the layers exposed, but geologically speaking, you can see the layers as they begin to press their way up north in this particular instance. And you're gonna have these matching layers as Dr. Snelling was referring to. Now, one of the things I want you to notice is you'll come all the way back to the left or north in the picture of the Bryce Canyon, and you'll see extra layers up there that don't show up in the Grand Canyon. Where did they go? Again, we're seeing the erosion of floodwater runoff. We're talking size of states and bigger where the floodwaters would have eroded sediment you can go up to the Grand Canyon and it's as flat as can be up at the edge. But there are little mesas ever so often reminding you that that sediment was even thicker even in the past. And so as we look at the mega sequence here, this is a chart. I hope this will make sense and be intuitive because I really was impressed by what this communicated. Now, first of all, when you see the numbers one, two, three, four, and five, think of those as pulses or energy surges in the flood itself. So what the flood is doing is, is it begins to pick up water and uh, as it takes water and sediment from the oceans and begins to move it onto dry land or cross dry land, that first pulse is one. And what happens is they're going to be able to read in the rock record an increase in the waters and then a slight decrease. Then pulse number two comes. And then pulse number three comes, four and five. All of this is the Genesis flood. All of this occurred within one year. Now, I can't tell you if it took two weeks and ten five days or if it took three months or what, but it all occurred within that time period. You see the timeline on there. These times are not observed dates. These times are not dates that can be derived from rocks. These are assumptions built in by secular deep time geologists. And instead of 600 million years of activity, I'm saying it's one, one event. So when dry land, when is dry land covered with water? Well, I think we begin to look, if you'll see the green dotted line across the top there, I've just kind of picked a rough time, but the floodwaters would have come and eventually inundated the land, but not continually. And that's really kind of a new revelation. During the time of the flood, would the dry land have been inundated with water every single second for that one year? No. And I know some of you are processing that right now and thinking, really? Dinosaur trackways are one of the key things that we find that really are good evidence. 
where waters come in, laid sediment down, but it didn't kill everything. The waters come back, but they're going to remain. The ground is still going to be wet and pliable. Maybe the ground is still going to be under a few feet of water, and you're going to find dinosaur trackways. We've got a trackway cast over here. Once it solidifies, the next layer comes in and buries it. And so what will happen is we're going to have little windows of dry land even within the flood. Is that going to refute the biblical narrative? It is not. Now see that low point right there to the right? What causes that drop? Well, I just gave it away. I got ahead of myself there, didn't I? While I'm not going to get into it today, I do want to make the point is that what happened as a result of the flood is an ice age which means that the ocean waters were warm and were evaporating, the air was cool, and again we see vast amounts of ice and snow being dumped onto the land masses and staying onto the land masses. What is that doing to the ocean levels? It's dropping them. And this also makes things like the Bering Strait between Alaska and Russia a possible bridge for animals to cross. We go down into India, uh, New Zealand, all the way down to Australia, and that would have all been exposed land all the way through. Has anybody ever heard of Zealandia? New Zealand is just the last remnant of what they believe would have been another continent. That if you dropped the ocean levels just enough, you would have had another continent exposed there. A couple of things here to just push on through with this. When we begin to look at geology, they begin to talk about mass extinctions. When you correlate them to what we're talking about with the pulses and the flood, they're misreading the data. And the flood simply would have captured and killed particular groups of animals. When we look at this chart here, we begin to recognize how the flood itself and the rock layers as they build themselves up, the ones at the bottom are mainly containing marine fossils because initially the flood would have captured that part of life. As the flood goes on, it captures more and more land animals. But I want you to notice is that we have aquatic life throughout the entirety of the fossil record. Why is that the case? Because the ground is underwater and will contain marine life the whole time during the flood. So it begins to ask the question is, what do we do with this? Because how many of us have walked in, seen this, I believe in the Bible, I believe in creation, and we say, I don't know what to do with this. I'm going to dismiss it. I want to reinterpret this for you. First of all, those times, that, those names that you see on the right are really just more names that are assigned to the rock layers. Let me... Uh, those are just names assigned to the rock layers. There's no such Jurassic time period. Time is assigned based on an evolutionary progression. The column on the left is nothing more than the transition of fossils that are getting caught. Remember what I just told you, the, at the bottom you would expect marine life, and as you go to the top you're going to get what? More and more land animals. That has been the thing that's been interpreted as an evolutionary progression, and I'm just telling you, it's just a byproduct of how the flood has functioned. So when we think about the mega sequences that I just mentioned to you, if we just simply recognize each mega sequence as a block of time as a, from these layers that the Silurian and the Ordovician and the Cambrian are all just part of one sequence. We're now beginning to recognize that this layering process, while not entirely con just made up, is really the layering is valid, the fossils are valid, but the time that we have had applied to them and the nature of the process has been the problem. And if we look at the flood as a sequential layering of sediment, we see it differently, don't we? 
Let me go through one more point because we're getting close on time. Y'all are hanging in there really good. I haven't lost any of you yet, have I? Don't tell me if, you, if I have, so how about that? Is that safe to do, Pastor? <laughs> so what we now have is I want to introduce, now we've got layers and pancakes, right? So how do we get mountains? How do we get these unique features going on? Well, the uplift uh, we've got here is we're looking along the west coast, and I'm talking literally from Alaska down to the tip of South America, that geological construct of how the land looks is almost identical all the way down. You have a subduction zone, oceanic crust. It is believed that what one of the key features at the initial part of the flood is the oceanic crust, which would have been tied into the continental crust, breaks and drops and begins to subduct underneath the continental crust. And now you've got some unique layers. And that process is it pushes itself inward from the west coast in underneath North America and South America as well. You begin to have those features showing up. Now those features are happening by and large under the water at this juncture. But you have along the west coast, you have multiple volcanoes. Mount St. Helens is one of the more famous ones, more well-known ones. That's as a result of the oceanic crust subducting. Genesis 8 talks about the waters being assuaged as we see God remembering life. Verse 2 says the windows of heaven were restrained. Verse 3 talks about the waters being abating. Verse 4 talks about the ark landing on the mountains of Ararat. Verse 5 says the waters decreased and the tops of the mountains were seen. So we're now beginning to see a shift in the energy. All that was going on in the waters is now beginning to subside, and that subsiding is now going to release geologically mountain formation, and those subduction areas begin to create some uplift. Psalm 104 talks about the mountains rising and the valleys sinking. Now my point here is that the mountains have been formed and are rising under the waters. Grand Teton National Park, at the very top, this is uh, Mount Moran, 13, no, 12,610 feet. What I've got circled there is a little, I think it's 75 feet thick of sandstone. At the top, there's nothing going on around Grand Teton these days that would create this. Sandstone is a layer of individual particles that are going to solidify when being buried under pressure. This means this was, these mountains were lower and they were underwater and sediment was packed on top of them and they lifted and this is just the last little bit of sandstone that's left over. You go up into Canada. If you'll notice how the snow highlights the horizontal stratified layers that only happens underwater. So what we're seeing is mountains are under the water being formed, sediments sitting on top, and then they're being uplifted. The Uinta Mountains, notice how they're horizontal bands, stratified layers only forming underwater. Glacier National Park, same type of horizontal banding. We can see it here at McDonald Lake, horizontal banding laid down underwater and lifted up. Remember what the biblical narrative just told us. The mountains were beginning to be seen. Noah's in the ark, and he finally has his, the ark rest on the mountains of Ararat. And the text says the mountains are beginning to be seen. What we're now recognizing theologically and in geology is the mountains are rising out of the waters. So let's stop there. Let's take about 10 minutes and we'll come back in here and I'll get and we'll, we'll press on, okay? All right, I got 4.30, so let's do 4.40. We'll be back in and get going again. <laughs>